good morning. So today's flight, we're gonna have a uh, bit of an adventure. We're gonna fly from Crimea um, in you know, the contested region of Ukraine to Moldova. And um, I just randomly chose a, uh, an air base in Crimea and a airfield in Moldova, uh, which will turn out to be interesting later in the video. And as you may know, there are conflicts in that region of the world, um, and many are wondering if Moldova could possibly be next. So uh, that's kind of why I'm doing this flight. A little disclaimer, I'm not a fighter pilot. I've never flown a Tomcat, and uh, I know that's shocking. But uh, yeah, we'll get to uh, take off here in just a few moments. Now, sadly, Customs seized my copy of my FAA uh, FAR frames, um, so unfortunately, we won't be uh, following many uh, FAA rules. And it's not because I don't want to, it's just because, you know, Customs seized the book and, well, this is a military flight. All right, now we're gonna do a pre-flight checklist here. So make sure we got that parking brake turned off. Just checking on my settings. I'm gonna have that VR map open so you can kind of see where we are in relation to our flight path. And doing just a few checks here before we are ready to do our takeoff roll. All passengers, please have your um, seats in the upright position and keep your seat belts uh, fastened throughout the I'll uh, take off and climb maneuver. Thank you. All right, we have achieved takeoff and we are doing our initial climb. And uh, unbeknownst to tower, we are going to be uh, flying uh, nap of the earth. So uh, instead of doing what we would typically do in most flights, uh, we'll be flying much, much lower. And uh, as you'll see here shortly, uh, tower is not going to be too happy about that. They'll have to deal with it. This is a military flight, as I said before. There's our destination. Uh, we will be flying to in Moldova. As you can see, it's um, you know, 205 nautical miles away. As, as I often do, I will do a little bit of time lapse in you know, slower moments of the flight just so it's a little bit easier for you all to watch. Because of that, I like to do that nav log so you can see what the actual flight time is. Uh, this this particular one required me to really stay focused on the controls because of the uh, nap of the earth flying. So, uh, and I made a mistake of trying to do this. Uh, and it was like, yeah, it was a bad idea. Don't do the checkoff list mid-flight. Um, and, but yeah, so um, I'll, I'll, I'll be focusing on flying the airplane throughout the entire time. So I have the nav log going so you can see what the actual flight time would be if it was in real time as opposed to time accelerated.
And then we have our first problem. As you can see, Tower has just told us to uh, stay with the radar contact. Obviously, this is a, uh, this is a Tomcat. We're flying into a very contested region. You know, could be a lot of uh, surface-to-air missile batteries around. We just can't run the risk of being able to be picked up by radar. So pretty soon here, we'll be taking some evasive maneuvers in order to have a much, much safer flight. All right, so I've become, begun my descent um, down to that nap of the earth uh, flying. I've looked up a few different things in, in military uh, doctrine. It's uh, basically at lower than 1,000 feet is considered you know, low, low flight flying. Um, I've seen with helicopters, it's much lower than that, maybe 200 feet. And I've seen some that recommend, you know, say, no more than maybe three or 800 feet above the ground. I believe I'm going to average probably about 600 feet. <laughs> That's over water. Um, props to any military pilot out there who has had to perform this type of flying because uh, the margins of error are very, very slim. You take your eyes off the controls for a second or a gust of wind comes and um, you find yourself uh, meeting the earth in an unexpected way. So as I'm talking to Tower here, and we're going to have a little bit of an argument, um, I'd, I'd like to, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, that low, low to earth flying, um, just some of its uh, information about uh, military aircraft, how they do it, why they do it. Um, also, in a few moments here during this flight, I'm going to talk about some of the geopolitics. We're um, flying over the Black Sea right now, so we're, we've left Crimea, uh, actually you'll see the Crimea Peninsula um, when we get past it, I'll, I'll look out and, and pan over to it. Uh, obviously, that is a contested region um, in Ukraine. When we get to the other side of the Black Sea, we're going to actually come right over Odessa, um, which is a, an amazing port city. Um, may, maybe you've heard of it. I've had the opportunity once to actually go visit there. I didn't have enough time on my trip to actually see it myself, but it is, uh, it's a very large port city um, in that region. So, then after that, we'll, we will head into Moldova, and I will talk about the geopolitics of Moldova and why there's so many concerns about that right now. Yeah, sorry the old tower. Um, I think we're going to suffer a bit of a uh, unplanned radio failure. <laughs> Just because they won't stop. <laughs> Continue to berate me to climb to a certain altitude. So, yeah, if I was in a uh, normal aircraft, we'd be squawking 7600. Just to let them know we had a radio failure. Anyhow, over there you can see that is uh, Crimea. Uh, that's the coast of it as we are now passing by.
couple quick numbers real quick from the uh, Kashka Air Base to the location I selected in Moldova. We're going to be traveling about 207 nautical miles. Uh, that is uh, 383.71 kilometers, um, or for those imperialists out there, uh, 238.43 miles. So, not a small flight, but a very capable flight for this type of aircraft. So, next, I just want to discuss a little bit of this nap of the earth flying, as you see now, as I've kind of tried to keep my um, aircraft under a thousand. So, Low-flying military aircraft training is something that it was employed um, after radar became available and is considered to be a very critical um, way of safeguarding your aircraft, both, both helicopters and airplanes. It does carry significant risk. So generally speaking, it's prohibited in any place that has, um, has civilian populations. And, um, you know, Europe and the United Kingdom have some very specific rules. I'm sure America has some very, very specific rules about it as well. It also carries some very um, significant haz hazards, um, such as collision with the ground, electricity, wires, um, you know, simple pilot error, um, or failure of an aircraft system, and absolutely no time to do anything about it. Um, you, basically, at, at this altitude, if anything goes wrong, there is almost no chance to even figure out what, what happened, much less make a correction or start to go through a checklist or fix the problem. Also, mid-air collisions have occurred with, uh, with lighter aircraft and other military aircraft. Bird strikes are, m are much, much more frequent at this, this uh, altitude. And um, noise can also disturb animals, so it can therefore cause hazards to, say, like horse riders. There was sadly an instance, I think it was in the United Kingdom, where someone was riding a horse and a aircraft flying at these low levels um, scared the horse, the horse threw the person off and the person unfortunately passed away. But basically since the Vietnam War um, and the start of the Cold War, this has been part of military doctrine. The Canadians, the Royal Air Force and um, the Australians uh, all, and, and America all um, practice this in their training. Uh, helicopters do it even to a more extreme extent. Um, they, so f uh, fixed wing aircraft can get down as low as 250 feet, which I'll be honest, I just did not feel comfortable getting that low. Um, and helicopters can get even lower. I want to say maybe even, you know, 50 to 100 feet, which um, uh, uh, at some point, you gotta, you gotta ask yourself how, how tall the tallest tree is when you're gonna fly that low. You don't want to hit the top of that tree. So, yeah, this this type of flying though is supposed to avoid radar and would be a very safe way to um, fly a military asset like this through a potentially contested region. Since we could have, you know, in this case, we could have uh, surface-to-air missiles armed by the Ukrainians. We could have them armed by the Russians and you know, an unidentified aircraft, you know, no transponder, just cruising by at a very fast speed might look like a suspicious target that someone could be trigger happy and just launch a missile at without even thinking. So that's why we're doing this. Now a little bit here, we're coming up to Odessa. So we've, we've gotten by uh, the Black Sea. So I'm going to start to do a climb up um, over uh, Odessa. Again, that's a a populated area and we'll take a few moments we're going to take a look at at the city here uh this is a, a giant port in ukraine a very bustling city it was a place that I w if i had had time i would have really enjoyed visiting when i went on my trip to ukraine a few years ago
All right, so now, now let's talk a little bit about the geopolitics of what's going on right now. As you may or may not be aware of, there is a, I, and I hate to even call it this, but I don't want YouTube to, uh, you know, flag this video, but there's a special operation going on in this region of the world with uh, one very large nation um, making incursions into this, another sovereign nation. The... <clears throat> The assumptions are that it's a, this is a little bit of a reunification of the former USSR empire, and uh, there's a particular um, document that talks about um, you know what the the heartland and what the heartland is, and it, excuse me, um, it was written in 1913. It's a little esoteric, but it appears to be the the playbook that some of these these old people who just need to get out of power uh, seem to be pulling from. Now. The area of um, Ukraine is a flat, low-lying area, so it is very hard to uh, defend. There's not many choke points. It is just geographically a a, a rough, rough area for you to, to have fortifications. So uh, a notion was is that the invading country was going to basically try to to capture all the way across the southern, or excuse me, the northern. Um, coast of the Black Sea, um, and into an area known as Moldova, in order to guarantee you know much more access to to um, warm water ports, you know, ports that don't freeze, which the invading country has a big problem with in winter. Their ports usually turn into solid ice, and therefore their navy becomes not so effective. The um, <clears throat> The leader of that country has said that he believes that the people of Moldova are ethnically Russian, which has come to be a pretty ominous statement. So it seems that whenever the leader of that country says that he believes the people of anywhere are ethnically Russian, it pretty much means he's going to, um, I'll say, um, uh, encroach upon the sovereignty of that nation, whether they like it or not. Also, Moldova has a very unique um, area called Transnistria, and Transnistria is a breakaway area that, that actually has a Russian garrison. Um, they are kind of a, a lawless no-go zone within Moldova, where they believe themselves to be their own country, and they have their own government, and they have the you know, Russian army, and it's just this weird kind of... You know, thing that exists in Europe. You know, you think about you know, having warring tribes and, and maybe some other countries you don't think about so much in, in Europe. But um, Transnistria and Moldova would would definitely be a target for um, this much larger um, Mother Russia to go and uh, try to, say, reunify or, um, you know, endorse or, you know, some, some other thing that may stir, stir up some trouble. So, the I think the concerns here have some validity to them. Um, Moldova does not have an, an arm; they're not part of NATO. First of all, uh, they do not have much of a budget to even have an army. So, uh, if things start to move in that direction, things could be pretty sticky pretty quickly. And perhaps some of the earlier failures um, in this last operation um, have delayed moving into Moldova. If things had gone according to plan. I think that they expected they would steamroll right through and Moldova would have been kind of the stopping point. But now, as we get to this part, um, I'm now approaching my, my airstrip. Um, we're starting our descent. We're going to make the announcement, and already I have my first red flag. This is not a towered airstrip. Um, this is a towered airfield. And uh, while I think I did very well on the landing, um, I don't think the FAA would agree. And uh, I hope that... Uh, Hope that you all give me a little bit of slack here, considering that uh, the, the Tomcat doesn't exactly have a uh, have a how-to book or a pilot operating handbook or an, even a landing checklist that uh, I can go with. I'm just kind of going off my instincts, so I know from flying uh, general aviation aircraft, and we're gonna hope for the best here. So I'm gonna oh, please uh, buckle your seatbelts tightly and um, put your seats in the upright position because we are coming in for a landing.
So I'm wa watching my altitude. Pattern altitude entry is usually about a thousand feet. We are over a populated area and um, I'm going to be turning to final in just a few moments. The goal is to line up right on that center line and this is a very, very narrow runway. So now I'm just trying to bleed off my airspeed. I've hit the throttle to zero. I don't know if this thing's supposed to have reverse thrusters, um, but I am now just attempting. I've got gear down, full flaps, and I'm just trying to get this baby on the ground. Leaving uniform Tango Romeo traffic, Boeing November 7 Tree Tree Hotel Hotel is clear of the runway. All right, woo! You know they say any landing you walk away from is a good landing. <laughs> so. I landed on the runway. Didn't stop on the runway, but I landed on the runway. <laughs> so yeah, I'm gonna bring this uh, this old Tomcat here to a full and complete stop, and um, then we're gonna do our our uh, post post flight uh, checklist, and we're gonna go ahead and see if we can complete this flight uh, properly with some noticeable quirks in your Microsoft Flight Simulator. Um, yeah, <laughs> so, but hey, look at that. You can see the airstrip in the background. It, you know, it was just a grass strip. Much, I just needed it to be a little bit longer than it was. Parking brake set. Exterior and interior lights off. Lead air. Com one and two off. L R D D I HUD and MCPD off. Battery. Now that that should be shut down, but um, you might be able to tell my engines are still running. So, uh, yeah, if anyone out there and knows where to find the uh, pilot operating handbook for the Tomcat, by all means, uh, let me know in the comments below. Uh, also, if you uh, if you enjoyed uh, this flight, or if you'd like to give me some critiques on um, how, you know, how well or how terrible I did, uh, maybe, maybe I have a fighter pilot uh, who happens to be watching this. Please, by all means, I would love to hear some, uh, some criticism, things I could do better, uh, or some uh, compliments if you think that uh, I managed to handle that well. So, at this point, I gotta figure out just how to how to end this. But as you can see, um, it's been ba it was basically a thirty minute flight. So pretty, pretty awesome, pretty straightforward, and uh, I, I thought a very very enjoyable flight. It was uh, this is one of the more fun flights I've done in a flight simulator that's just for fun, not for like aviation um, training or anything. As you can see, the objective there is to stop the main engine, which, um, you know, is a question of how we accomplish that. So I'm going to do it uh, the, uh, the smart way. Um, after I check my checklist here just one more time. Just seeing, did I forget anything? Yeah. No, that's after takeoff. That's before takeoff. Okay. Alright, so, yeah, I think what we should probably do here is just um, open up the fuel, um, <laughs> the, uh, the fuel um, uh, filler thing in the GUI and just drop the fuel level to zero, which is what I do. And 
give it a couple seconds and that should uh, should accomplish the uh, engine shutdown. But yep, hopefully the Navy is happy with my landing. Uh, didn't put a scratch on her, didn't put a ding on her. Got her down safely. Just, you know, a little bit, a little bit further than uh, maybe the runway had been designed for. And that's pretty much going to conclude it for this flight. Um, it's in, it's going to go into a check out here in a moment. So uh, I hope that you guys enjoyed this video. If you uh, if you like this, feel free to uh, bless the YouTube algorithm by giving me a like. Uh, if you want to give me any feedback, maybe other things you'd like me to do, um, you know, throw some comments. Uh, if you like these kind of current current um, events types of things and just kind of flying in, in some of these areas to talk about this stuff, by all means, let me know if you like that. I'll be happy to do some more of those videos. And uh, thanks for watching. Hope to see you in the next video.